Excited, yeah. I know this, uh, we, had a, we had a great week. It started uh, here at Valley View. It started last Sunday when uh, Josiah challenged you to remember. Just to remember, is it better to remember or, or to know the future? Is it, is it better to remember or to know the future? And he challenged you to just to remember all the things that God has done. And then you write that down. And then, and then turn that into us. Send it to us by email. Send it into us by video, however you want. And then because of what God has done, you will. Because of what God has done, you will do something. And we, we started the week off that way. And we didn't hear from a whole lot of you. But we want to. So if you've forgotten, we want to remind you to go back to that, that website, our website, and, and we'll listen to that sermon again. And then, and then fill that out for us. Let us know. Let's hear from you. Because then we went from Sunday to Tuesday where we, some of us got a day off. And we got to remember all, the, all that some people have done for us to have a nation where we're free to worship which is an amazing, amazing thing. And then even some more things happened this week where uh, here at Valley View, or this weekend, some people gathered and, and they went out into our community and they, they just began to pray. God, God, would you move in this community? They, they went through some neighborhoods. They went through some apartment complexes. They went through some businesses and they just prayed. God, God would you just move in this place and allow Valley View to have some level of influence as we, as we lead others here? Uh, would, you, would you let that happen? And then, and then this morning, we had a couple things happen. And maybe you got to be a part of. We had uh, Austin and Amanda from, from Ghana uh, teaching a class behind me in, in, in room 230 and uh, letting us know uh, what's going on in, around the other side of the world from, from Ghana, Africa. And uh, I know that they're in our room today, and you, you can maybe meet them out in the lobby. They have a table out in the lobby. We'd love for you to meet them. Uh, but they were just letting us know what's going on in their ministry entitled T, uh, Training Tomorrow's Leaders. I'd love for you to stop by their booth on the way out before, before you leave today. But maybe also uh, you remember what it's like to go to camp. And this morning we sent over, uh, over 40 students to Tennessee. And they all piled up, got a big, were gathered together this morning. And they left early or a little earlier. And they're on their way to Tennessee to go to, to something called MOVE, which we're really excited about with some adults' supervision. And I need you to pray for them. Maybe, maybe you remember what it was like to go to camp. Those of you who had that opportunity, you maybe some of you have to remember a little bit further back than some others, but you remember what it was like to have God work in your life and to God do some amazing things in your life. I, this morning, I want to start by getting you to transition your mind even further back than high school. I want, you to, I want to take you all the way back to your elementary age days where you remember being on the playground. Because on every playground, every playground has a legend. And at Rockbridge Elementary School in Columbia, Missouri, when I was attending that elementary school, Wendell Jackman was a legend. Wendell Jackman could not be beat at anything. Tetherball, he beat everybody. Kickball, he beat everybody. His team always won. Dodgeball, he was always the last man standing. And whether it was on a basketball court or whether it was on a football field, Wendell was always, always, he always came out victorious. No matter what, he was, a, he was a legend at our school. He, he, he could not be beat. And maybe his specialty, the thing that he excelled at the most, was racing people. Just, he, he could always beat people. Anybody, any legends on the playground out here this morning? Not so much, huh? Not a Wendell Jackman out there? But think about this. Wendell, Wendell loved to just race people. And sometimes he would slow up because people would be slower than him. And he'd wait and then he'd make them run to the very end and he'd beat them at the finish line. He was, he was a legend on our playground until one day Kenny White moved to town. Kenny White, Kenny White would eventually become the starting quarterback at the high school where I would attend and Kenny and I would be good friends. But Kenny, he knew it was inevitable that one day on the playground he would have to race Wendell. And we all were looking forward to that day because we kind of knew that Kenny was a little athletic, but it happened. We, we had this big, interesting playground. It was about 100 yards long. It was all asphalt. And at the end of the asphalt was this green soccer field and green football field and green baseball field. And, and they would always start the race at the cafeteria. You had to put your hand on, on a brick wall like that one back there, put your foot against the wall, and someone would say go, and the two racers would take off running. And the day came. The day came for Kenny to race Wendell, and they, they lined up. They both put their hands on the wall, and everyone, everyone sprinted to the grass because that's where the, the finish line would be. Except for me, I, I decided to kind of get a, a halfway viewpoint. And someone said go, and off Kenny and off Wendell ran, and they, they came to the finish line, and Wendell 
Wendell beat Kenny. But Wendell came in second. Because not everyone was paying attention to what was happening about 20 yards south of where they were running. A little girl by the name of Susie had put her hand on the wall. And about halfway through the race, I noticed that she was right with them. And she was just further out of view. Nobody was really paying attention to Susie. And she was running as fast as little Susie Garcia could run. And she passed the finish line before either one of those two boys. And no one knew it. And I, I was so excited that I thought everybody surely saw Susie pass the finish line. So I ran over to Susie. Susie, you realize what you've done? You've beaten Wendell. You got you to race him head to head. You got you to be the one to do it. And she said, she shook her head. No, she said, I, I don't know if I, I can do that. I said, you, you got to use what you have. You got to beat Wendell. And, and, and she, she just shook her head. She said, no. And I looked down at her feet and she was barefoot. She'd been running on asphalt in bare feet and she beat these two boys. And in my own mind, she became the new legend of the playground. But no one else would know because she wouldn't race him head to head. So I ask her this question, the same question I want to ask you this morning. What is it that you're waiting for? What is it that you're waiting on? When it comes to your life with Jesus, what are you waiting on? Are you, are you waiting for approval? Are, are you waiting for some kind of, some level of confidence to, to rise up within you? Are, are you waiting for that secure feeling knowing that you would win? Are you, are you waiting for the assurance that, that you need in order to even get into the race? Are you, are, you, are you waiting on affirmation from those around you, patting you on the back? Are you, is that what you're waiting on? What are you waiting on? Are you waiting for a clear-cut direction? It's which way to go? What is it that you're waiting on in your life? Are you waiting for some kind of obstacle to be removed? Are you waiting for the right finances? Are you waiting for the right season of your life? What, do you, what is it that you're waiting on? It's really important for you and I as, as, as followers of Jesus to take some time just to reflect. A couple of weeks ago, I took, I took one of those moments in my life. I do it every once in a while just to, just to spend some time thinking about this question. God, if you have something to say to me, if you have something that you need to say to me, would you just say it? Because I'm ready to hear you. And, I, and asking those questions of, God, is this the right place for me? Is this the right assignment for me? Is this the right time for me? God, is someone else more suited to do what, what you're asking me to do? God, what is it that you're asking? Are, are you, God, am I doing what you, what you want? Kind of throwing my hands up in the air and, and, and literally asking, God, what do you want from me? We, we know this because we just finished this series last week on David, the legend of David. And we know this about what God asks of people. We know that God doesn't ask the, the most bold or the most beautiful or the brightest. He doesn't even have to ask the most courageous or the most confident people to do his calling. He, he's looking for the obedient people. He, he's looking for the one who would be the most obedient. And those, those who lead others need to lead others from where they're called. What God's calling you to do. In our, our Legends series over the next couple of weeks, next three weeks, we'll actually, we're going to kind of spend some time in the book of Judges. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn there here in just a little bit. But over the next three weeks, we'll be in the book of Judges, and we'll specifically be looking at, a, at the life of a man by the name of Gideon. And the, and the book of Judges is, is the narrative part of Israel, God's people, in history. And it looks like this on a timeline. It looks like this, where uh, the nation of Israel, the, the time of, of the book of Judges takes place between where God's people had moved into a promised land that God had promised to give them. They had moved into that promised land under a man by the name of Joshua. You, you remember Moses was the one who led the people of God out of the land of Egypt, but God didn't allow him to go in. And so he hands the baton of leadership off to Joshua. And Joshua goes into the promised land, and he, from a military standpoint, he defeats all of the enemies of God's people. And as the defeats happen one after the other, the people of God begin to settle in the land that God had promised to them. But eventually, Joshua dies. And so for about 330 years after the death of Joshua, for about 330 years, Israel, until Israel becomes a monarchy under King David, 
They're, they're literally just like a commonwealth, what we, would, what we would call a commonwealth, like our 13 colonies when our, when our, when our nation began. They didn't have a centralized government. They had, a, they had a common language. They had a common ancestry. They had a common religion. They had a lot of things in common, but they were 12 very distinct tribes. They all lived together in this one place. And the reason that there were 12 distinct tribes has to go all the way back to when God promised a man by the name of Abraham, hey, you're going to make me a nation. And Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. And Jacob has 12 what? Sons. And those 12 sons become the 12 tribes that are now presently in the land that God had promised. And so during this book of Judges, you have these 12 tribes existing together. But one thing's for sure, they have no leader. They have no, they have no central king. They have no king. Why? Because God is supposed to be their king. Because they're supposed to view God as the one who would rule over them. And God, God had given them his law. And God, God had said, you're supposed to obey the law. You're supposed to be obedient to the law. But I'll, I'll provide you with judges. Someone who will not only distribute the law, someone who will not only appoint the law to you, but someone who will also come alongside you. And if you need to be delivered from an enemy, some of these judges could step in. Their only authority was to do that. So here's what happens. You, you know what happens whenever there's a list of rules written on a wall, right? People start to abandon the law. And God's people just said, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. And the nation of, of Israel just abandoned God's law. Why? Because that nation has something in common with you and I. You and I don't like anyone telling us what to do. No, matter of fact, nobody that I've ever met likes to have anybody telling them what to do. Nobody likes that. And, and in their minds, the law was written some, so long ago that it doesn't affect their day and age. It was written so far away that there, there's no real king to, to supervise it. There's no real government to enforce it. So basically, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And J Judges chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning. Judges chapter 6 verse 1 tells us something about the people. Notice what it says. The Israelites, God's people, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. As you read through the book of Judges, and I'd encourage you over the next three weeks just to read through it. You'll read through it pretty fast, and at the end of this, the book of Judges, a really weird story. You just need to read it. But as you read through the book of Judges, you'll recognize really quickly that there's a cycle of life that happens throughout the book, where the, that the people of God go through this cycle. And here, here's the cycle. Here's what the cycle looks like. There's the law that they're supposed to be obedient to, but you know what happens. They become disobedient. The cycle looks like this on the screen. They're, they're disobedient to God's law, and it would result in some kind of disaster that God would say, okay, you're disobedient. Here's, here's something that will grab your attention. And then they would, they would cry out to God, God, would you help us? God, would you help us? And God would step in and send them a deliverer. God would step in. And then they would go back to disobey one more time, and then they would fall into some kind of disaster. And then they would cry out to God and God would deliver them. And they would say, oh, I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to do this again. I don't ever want to be in this position again. Sound familiar in your life? And here's the interesting thing about the book of Judges. That even if you're not a believer in Jesus, or maybe, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, or maybe you were a Christian at one time, or maybe you've just gotten a, away from it for a while, Here's what we all have in common. Every one of us in this room have been disobedient. You, you either have disobeyed a religious law that you grew up with, or every one of us has disobeyed our parents at some point, or, or maybe this, you've disobeyed your conscience because your conscience told you, don't do it, don't, don't, don't go there, don't do it, don't do it. Don't do it. And you know what? You, you did it, right? 
And when you did it, you all of a sudden ended up in some kind of disaster because there was a time when, when you disobeyed your conscience, when you disobeyed God, when you disobeyed your parents, that there was, when you disobeyed some religious experience in your life, you, you started to realize the disaster. And then somebody, somebody came along, somebody came along and, and gave you a break. So, somebody, somebody gave you a second chance. Somebody broke you out of jail. Somebody paid a fine for you. Somebody, somebody gave you a hand up. Somebody put you through rehab. Somebody helped you into this new life that you found where you currently are residing. And, and you're just like me because you say this all the time. I'll never do that again. I'll never do that again. I don't ever want to do that again. I'll never go back. And you know what? You don't. You didn't. You didn't go back for about a week, right? It lasted for about a week. And then all of a sudden you found yourself in some kind of disaster again, crying out to God for help. And there's so, there's so, much, there's so much in this book of Judges that speaks and reflects our life. And for about 330 years, think about this, for 330 years, that cycle was repeated in an entire nation, every person. They got in trouble and God would deliver. See, we turn to God when we have nowhere else to turn. But the amazing thing about this book is it also gives us a reflection of the heart of God. That when we have nowhere else to turn, God always turns his face to us. And he wants to deliver you. And he wants to get you out of the mindset that you're in. But here's the amazing thing to me about the story of Gideon. Is that he calls Gideon the same way that he calls us. And he's calling you this morning to be in the delivery business of leading others to him. And some of you are going, nah, not me. I'm not in the business of leading other people. I'm not in the business of trying to deliver people from their disasters. But the same call that goes out to Gideon is the same call that he's calling you to this morning. God is calling you to be in the deliverance business when it comes to people. And I know what you're thinking because you thought this back in January when I first mentioned it to you, this idea of leading others. I'm not a leader. Maybe God can find somebody else. I, don't, I wouldn't know what to say. I don't know how people would respond. I, I'm, I'm kind of unfit for this. I, I'm, I'm really unqualified. And, and we become real dismissive of what God is calling you to do. And I, I want you to hear me this morning. Because a lot of our spiritual growth is not something you need to learn. It's just something that you need to Remember. And this morning, I want to remind you at a very emotional level, at a very intellectual level, at a very heart-to-heart level, this one simple thought is that your calling from God is waiting. Your calling from God is waiting. It's waiting for you to embrace it. It's waiting for you to respond to the voice and the message that God has for you. Judges chapter 6 Verse 11 is where I want to start this morning. Here's what I want us to read. Your calling is waiting. Judges chapter 6. The angel of the Lord came, and he sat down under the oak at, in Ophrah. That's before she got her TV show, right? <laughs> that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. Listen, you, you, need to, you need to speak to your Bible so it can speak back to you. Because who in their right mind would thresh wheat in a wine press, right? Why, why is Gideon threshing wheat? What are you doing in a wine press threshing wheat? Everybody knows you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. Because of this reason, because the wine presses generally were down below ground sometimes, and you had to thresh wheat above ground where the wind could blow the chaff away. How many of you have ever threshed wheat in your life? Again, no legends, no threshers of wheat, right? <laughs> so let me explain some things to you. What they would do is they'd take stalks of this wheat, and they would either beat it onto the ground, or they would take sticks and beat this, this, the kernels of, of stalks of wheat, and then, and then they'd they toss it up into the air, and the chaff would blow away the stuff that they didn't want. 
The wind would blow it away, and the good kernels of wheat would fall to the ground. But listen, if, if, you, if you don't do it above ground where the wind can blow it away, you're wasting your time, which is often what we do. Why, why is Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press? Well, verse 2 through 10 will tell you why. Gideon's afraid. Gideon's hiding. Matter of fact, the entire nation of Israel is hiding. Why? Because they, they had disobeyed. And disaster was on them. Disaster had come. And this cycle of sin was continuing to thrust God's people into hiding. And when, and when they... Listen, and you, you know this about yourself too, that when you've had enough misery or when you've lasted long enough or when you've longed long enough, you'll call out to God. And God, every time, will send a deliverer. And so he sends a deliverer. He goes to get one. And Gideon is the next one in line. And can I, can I just tell you this? Gideon didn't get the memo until just right now. That's why he's down in the wine press threshing wheat. And for some of you this morning, you need to see this, that God has something. Let me say it like this. God has someone. Someone that God is calling you to lead. Someone that God is calling you to, to deliver, help deliver. See, Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press because he needed to keep the good stuff from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, this angel says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Let me ask you, does the Lord, does the Lord ever say some stuff to you that does, doesn't make sense? Like in the context of your circumstances, does God ever speak to you and say some things to you that just doesn't make sense? Gideon's thinking, I'm down here in this wine press threshing wheat trying to hide because I'm scared. And this angel comes to me and he thinks, he thinks I'm a mighty warrior. He, he says mighty warrior. He thinks I'm a mighty warrior. God, this is embarrassing to you because I'm not a mighty warrior. I'm just an industrious farmer. Why didn't you say I'll be with you, industrious farmer? God, I, I'm sorry that you think I'm something that I'm not. I'm sorry that you think I'm stronger than I am. You thought I was stronger. You, you just need to go look for someone else. Mr. Angel, you need to, you need to update the phone on, your phone on the GPS because I think you went to the wrong wine press. I'm not who you think I am. I, I'm Gideon. I'm the guy who's afraid of dying down here in this wine press. You need to know this, that God has a way of seeing your potential. And then he'll call some things out in you you didn't see. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes we just wait. We wait for, we're waiting until we're ready for God to use us, till we're ready. But, but let's be honest, we'll never be ready for God to use us in the ways that God wants to use us. And I, I, I can be on, I can identify really well with, with Gideon because he's, he's fearful what are people going to think? What are people going to do? And for Gideon, this is a scary step for him because it's going to change. It's going to wreck his whole life. Sometimes God comes in and just wrecks your whole life. He's calling you to do something maybe you don't want to do. Listen, I'm a living testimony of that. Because when I was growing up, after I got out of, when I was in, on that playground at Rockbridge Elementary, I, I, just, I thought, I'm going to just work with my hands because that's what I thought God was God had blessed me with. I just want to work with my hands. I just want to keep my head down, my eyes focused on the things that my hands were going to work on. And I was just going to keep my mouth shut. Until my dad, my dad came and said, Joe, I just want you to go to Bible college for a year. I know you have other thoughts about what God wants for your life, but I just want you to go to Bible college for a year. God will speak to you there. <sighs> okay, dad, I'll obey you. I go to Bible college and God spoke to me and you know what I said? God, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong leader here. God, God, you got, you, you got, you've mistaken me for somebody else. God, you got the wrong person. This is not going to be the right assignment for me. This is the wrong assignment for me. This isn't the right time for me. This is the wrong time for me. 
I've felt like that my whole life. But God, God's crazy. God's got a way of speaking and calling. Just watch Gideon's response to this angel. And I want you to know this. I'm not equating myself with Gideon. Like I'm not a deliverer of people. I just know that God calls. And some of you are sitting there thinking, God hasn't going to call me. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. He calls everyone. This is what he says. Verse 13. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. Remember, he's down in the wine press. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Don't, didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midianites. God, where have you been? You ever ask that question? God, where have you been? I'm going through this situation in my life. God, where have you been? Where have you been? And the Lord turned to him and said this, You just go in the strength that you have, and you save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Singular? Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how, you need to underline this, how can I, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest in Manasseh. That's outside of Texas, by the way. (laughs) My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my family. Gideon says this, "I, I would if I could. I would if I could, but I can't, so I won't. You ever say that to God? God, I would would want to lead somebody, but I can't, so I won't. I I think I'm just going to wait until it's the right time. Gideon's saying, it's really, really cool, God, that you're calling me to do this, but, and listen, we use very similar cop-outs when it comes to to leading other people. I'm not a leader. I I don't know my Bible well enough. God, you don't really know what I've done, which is kind of funny to say to God. We, we throw every obstacle we can in front of that conversation. We put every hindrance we can so that God has to move around them. We, put, we speak with our mouth every excuse that we can possibly speak when God calls. But what I would like to do in the remaining moments that we have this morning together is just give you three observations about your calling because your calling is important. And God is calling you. I just need to know if you're listening. And more importantly than listening, I just need to know if you're going to respond. And more importantly, I just need to know if you're going to embrace what God is going to say to you. And yes, there is a calling. And I'm praying more than anything that God would give me clarity so it's clear in your mind of what God is calling you to. So here's the first one. Your calling. Your calling is active and not passive. It's active and not passive. As you you read this text, notice how Gideon interrupts God but with all kinds of cop-outs and comparisons, like cop-outs about what he's not and what he he can't do and what God used to do. And and as he's speaking to God, God kind of interrupts him. And he, he he doesn't even acknowledge the excuses that Gideon gives to him. He just simply says this. He interjects a command in verse 14. He just simply says this. You go. Go in the strength that you have. I, I love that because, because in our context, in our, in our context and circumstances in life, we're more than content just to sit in a wine press and thresh wheat. We don't, we don't even want to acknowledge that God is saying to you, go in the strength that you have. We, we think we need God to give us something more so that we'll be able to do whatever God is asking of us. And God says, no, you just go. You just go in the strength that you have. God doesn't speak to Gideon about the, the, things that he, the strength that he doesn't have. He, de- he doesn't speak to Gideon about the strength that he wishes that he had. He doesn't speak to Gideon about the circumstances that he's in or the circumstances that he wishes that he had. God simply says, go. And listen, that's a word for someone in this room who's trying to stay. And you know who you are. You know who you are. Because God is telling you, go. You have what you need to go. You just need to go. In the strength that you have. Yeah, but I don't have. You know, just go in the strength that you have. Yeah, but we, I, need, I need someone to lead me. We don't have a leader like that. No, you go in the strength that you have. Don't we pay a church staff to go? No, you need to go in the strength that you have. 
You're responsible for you. God says, God says, go in the strength that you have. But, but wait, these people might say this. They might do this. They, what are these people going to do to me? No, you just go in the strength that you have. Listen, it's really cool of you to think that you have limitations and to know your limitations. But when your limitations lead to frustrations, you know what? You're not going to get, get to do what God is calling you to do. Your limitations will lead you to endless frustrations if you don't go with what you have. And I don't know if you have these people in your house or in your life. I, I've been around them several times, but they, they do these, they say things like this. God, I'm just standing here with my hands raised in a worship service. God, just speak to me. God, will you just give me a call? Will you just give me a sign? Will you just give me some kind of warning, some kind of opportunity? And they stand there and they wait and they beg God. And they don't hear so they think to themselves, God must not be calling me to do that. That's not what he's calling me to do. I never had that aha moment like you're talking about. So I guess God's not calling me. And we, because we think, we think that, that our calling is something that has to happen to us. Like you're supposed to fall into some kind of trance or get struck by lightning. Or you walk through the woods and all of a sudden the clouds begin to form in the sky and blood starts to drip from the clouds and it forms the name of the city street or the, the name of the person that you're supposed to go call to. That's, how what, that's what we think a calling is like. You know, a calling is active. And I, I think this, that too many Christians, too many, too many believers are passively waiting for what they want instead of working with what they've got. That may be you. Because here's what Peter and John did one day. On their way into the temple in Acts chapter 3, they, they were going there to pray. And they ran into a man that was begging, and this man came up to them and said, listen, I need some silver, I need some gold, I need some coinage, I need a fare, I need some food, I need some shelter, I need, I need, I need. And Peter says, he kind of looks around, he, I guess he didn't have pockets in his toga, so he, he said, I don't have what you need. But what I do have, I'm going to give to you. And he, he reaches out his arm and he says, just grab my hand. And he pulls this man to his feet. And you know what scripture says? That all of the people were amazed because this man started to run around leaping and praising God. They were amazed, not because this man used to be a beggar, but because a believer used what he had and given it away. And when you use what you already have, God will do what only God can do. You're, you're, a mighty, you're a mighty warrior, even if you're fearful in the wine press. And listen, the people who do great things for God, those people who do legendary things for God, are those same people who, look at their circum, who don't look at their circumstances. They don't look at their inconveniences in life. They look at their calling. And here's why I'm telling you this. That God has already placed you somewhere. God has already positioned you somewhere. Even in the midst of challenges, even in the midst of drawbacks, God has placed you where he needs you the most. Maybe it's in the wine press. Maybe it's with all of your insecurities. Maybe it's with all of its drawbacks. But he has already placed you where he has called you. You just need, you just need to embrace it. That's what he needs you to hear this morning. And I'm praying that someone in here might, might literally stop thinking outside the box. Because when we start thinking outside the box, we talk ourselves out of things. Like we think about what we would do if we had more money, if we had more, if we had more training or no, more knowledge or, or fewer excuses or more courage. Or we, we think about what we, would, what we would do if we lived in a, different, in a different neighborhood or a different apartment complex or on a different street. And all of that wishful thinking never makes the box go away. So maybe we just need to think inside the box and, and say these things. Not what would I do if I had, but what should I do since I do have this? That's what we should be thinking. Five loaves, two fishes, Jesus, this is all I got. You need to do something with this. You think you can do something with this. Here you go. And listen, Jesus always will. Jesus will always use whatever you have. You just have to embrace it. You need to stop waiting on God to call you to some other place. Watch God grow you in the place that you're in. Your calling is active, not past. Your calling is present, not future. It's wonderful to think about tomorrow. 
about what God wants to do through you and in your life. But, but if you notice in this passage, everything that God spoke to Gideon was in present tense. And Gideon was all over the place. Like, wh- where, where are all those wonders that our forefathers told us about? Past tense. God, how will I be able to stand against these people who are much stronger than me? Future tense. God, God is present tense. Go. Just go. Go in the strength that you have. Your, your calling is always present. It's intended for this afternoon. It's, your calling is intended for this moment, for the other people in this room. Yeah, but doesn't God want me to, to plan, make a plan for the future? You bet. But if all I think about is what I'm going to do for God and I'm waiting for him to give me something to kick it all off, then I will spend my whole life waiting on God to lead me into something that he's already led me into. Did you hear me? And some believers just simply wait around for something that's right here the whole time. Because oftentimes we stand back and we say, God, just give me a direction. Give me a sign. Give me a warning. Give me some opportunity. And God says, listen, I I gave you your kids. Raise them. Teach them to love me. I, I, I positioned you next to your neighbor. Love them to death. I put you next to that coworker who you can't stand. Love them. Like you, like you never have before. I put you in the right place. Listen, God wants you to know that you need to stop deferring your destiny one day when, whenever I get. When never comes. You need to start right now. Because when you start to get passionate about where God's calling you in this present tense, you'll never be able to go where God wants you to go in the future. Thirdly, your calling is a person. It's not a place. In, in that translation that I read to you from the NIV, God tells Gideon, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving no one alive. If we just read that verse at face value like I just did a while ago, it would appear that God is just speaking to Gideon in isolation. That he's not including everybody. Like, I will be with you, Gideon. Gideon. You will strike down all the Midianites, Gideon. But in all, all actuality, when the, maybe the more accurate English translation is when you, when you read this and you recognize that what God's really saying here is, I will be with you, Israelites. I will be with you, God's people. And together you will strike down all of my enemies, all of your enemies. Together you will do this as one man, as one person. You need to recognize this, that as a church, that how effective we can be together when you hear and respond to the call of God in your life. See, I think the wrong question for us to ask that we, we ask a lot is, God, what's your will for my life? Maybe the better question is, God, what is your will and how can I be a part of it? Whatever part you want me to be, God, even if it's the most insignificant piece, even if it's the most insignificant portion of what we're going to do together, God wants you to know this, that what you are a part of is greater than any part or role that you play. And Gideon says this, I'm the least in my family. My tribe is the the smallest in all, all of this. And God says, will you just get over yourself? Do you know who you are? More importantly, do you know who I am? Will you just get over your, yourself because you're, you're my warrior. I'm not calling you to have the resources you need. I'm not calling you to have the courage to fight. I'll take care of the winning the battle. I'll take care of all of your battles. I'll fight them all. I'll place you and position you where, where you need to be. You just need, you just need to trust me, Gideon. Listen, you will always have what you need to do whatever God is calling you to do. And if you do what only you can do, God will, God will intervene. God will step right into the middle of you, and whether you're in whatever state you're in. God will step into the middle of all that, and then you better watch out. Because you know what's going to happen? As God works among us, God will change the city. God will chase the devil right out of here. He'll chase racism right off our streets. Hatred right out of, out of this community. When we do what God is calling us to do, he will put a church that has a community of God followers, Jesus followers, and together we become this unstoppable force in this place. 
God says, I'm not promising you that you won't have opposition. The reason I'm calling you is because there's going to be opposition. I'm not, I'm not assuring you that opposition will cease. I'm just assuring you that, that the one who's bigger than the opposition, that's greater than the opposition, will go before you. I will be with you, God said. And here's an amazing thing about God's calling on your life is that when you begin to acknowledge the presence and the power of God, your calling will be evident in that place because God is there. So you need to quit thinking that you need him to transplant you someplace else or put you in a different place because your calling's not a place, it's a person. And Rondell, this, this passage is for you because you asked me about a calling from a minister's perspective one day last week. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says this. The Apostle Paul wrote this. As a prisoner for the Lord, it's not a place. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you, I plead with you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have. Be completely humble, be gentle, be patient. You bear with one another in love. You make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Your calling has more to do with who you are becoming than what you will ever do. Let me say that again. Your calling has more with who you are becoming than what you will ever do in this life. So let me just speak some things over you this morning to challenge your thinking, to close you out today. Don't shove me off yet. So many people are trapped in this mindset that I'm not sure I'm in the place where God wants me to be. And unless you're Jonah running from God, you're in the place that God wants you to be. You need to do what my grandmother always told me. Every time she saw me, she would say these words to me. Joe, you can put your name there. Bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. You be as productive as you possibly could be wherever God puts you. Whatever assignment, whatever opportunity, whatever wine press you're in, whether you're in a battle or not, you bloom where you're planted. Why? Because God will be with you. I'll be with you in the wine press. I'll be with you in the war, Gideon. You allow God to do whatever he needs you to do in you, right here, right now. That's for you. Secondly, our, our calling, this took me a while to get to in my life. Our calling isn't to be successful at anything. Our calling is to be obedient in everything. Did you hear me? That our calling is not to be successful at anything. It's to be obedient in everything that God puts in our, in our path. And he, he will always position us. He will always place us where he needs us. He will put us into the right conversations, into the right circumstances, into the right context so that you can be obedient in every form of your life. Some of you need to hear that. Lastly is this. God is saying he wants to connect with you, mighty warrior. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person on your right or your left and you, you just say, hey, you're a mighty warrior. Say it to him. Okay, and then here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to, the, to your second choice, okay, the one that you didn't choose, and say that to them. Say it to the next person. You're a mighty warrior. And I know some of you, some of you feel like a wimp. Some of you feel like you're defeated because you're sitting there going, I can't do this because you, you don't know if you've been called. I'm just telling you that God has called you. And, and for those of you who have this mindset, some of you feel like you've done enough. Some of you feel like you, you, can't, you can take it easy now. Some of you feel like somebody else can now step in and take the baton. Let me just tell you this. No, God is wanting to reconnect you, mighty warrior, with your calling. You are not done yet. So let me go back to my question. What is it? What is it that you're waiting for? What is it that you're waiting on? Only you can answer. Some of you this morning are caught in disobedience. Some of you are caught in major disasters in your life. And you need, you've cried out to God, and I promise you, God will deliver. But sometimes you need church people to come alongside you and help you deal with the disobedience, and sometimes you need a church to come alongside you and help you with the disasters. But all of us need Jesus to deliver. And all of us in this room know people who need a deliverer. 
in their life. And I'm just telling you that you're that person in the place where God has placed you. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for this story of Gideon. God, the calling that you place on all of our lives isn't just to sit back. It's not to, to hang out or to sit low underground. God, you've called us to be a mighty warrior in your name. That is what we are. Father, would we know that today? And Father, there are people in this room who just need to be delivered from their sin because of their disobedience, God. Would they be perked by your spirit? God, would they ask the questions that they need to ask? Would they find you, Lord? God, would this church, would this church be what you need it to be? It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen.